everybody. Hi, hello, hi, I'm Jo, and I'm one of the organisers of Arts Digital, and our other organiser is Caroline, who's going to be filming tonight. So, in case you don't, in case you don't know, Arts Digital, we're a quarterly meetup group, and basically, we discuss um, the influence of digital is happening, having on, um, on culture, really. And what we do is we choose subjects which are affecting us in our day-to-day -day lives. So, today, we're going to be talking about open source, because that's something from the subject that's really, really close to my heart. So the format of the evening is, there's going to be three talkers, and then there's going to be a Q&A, and then we all go to the pub. So tonight is going to be, I'm really thrilled, we've got Jamie, Com Jamie Novick from CompuCore, um, who is basically their advocates of, of open source, they're web developers and they do all open source things, they're really involved in the open source community, they push the CIVI CRM, so that's going to be really interesting. Then we've, we've got Ruth Catlow from Furtherfield, so that's... that's and they basically they create online and physical spaces for everybody, so to engage with digital and to engage with culture. So it's a slightly different way of looking at open source. And then finally, we've got Ashley Van Heften, who is an open source advocate and has done an amazing project for the Welcome Collection. That's how I first met Ashley, through doing um, a talk at Wikimedia, talking about this amazing project where they uploaded 100,000 images from the Welcome Collection to Wikipedia. So that's it. That's it for me. And yeah, thank you for coming. Just to introduce myself, my name is Jamie Lovick, I'm here from a digital agency, our name's CompuCorp. Uh, excuse the kind of 1970s name, the company's actually been around the uh, best part of 35 years. Uh, I came in about five years ago. Uh, and we kind of changed the direction of, of what we're doing to, to focus on open source. Um, I'm what I kind of like to call an, an open source advocate. Um, I really believe in the value that open source uh, can uh, deliver to organisations and it's kind of put us in a position working with a number of non-profits uh, and organisations for, uh, for greater social change or uh, improving uh, social benefit um, uh, which has been really great. Um, open source is very much a growing, uh, a growing area within technology especially in its prevalence that it's kind of coming through into the mass uh, or the masses or the public and people starting to understand it and it's only been in the last I say one, two, three years that it's actually managed to kind of break through into people's consciousness um, and actually we'll, when I go through a little bit I might talk about how you know kind of open source has been around for you know 40 years maybe 45 years as kind of a, a, a concept um, and kind of where it's come from etc and then it's interesting that it's only really in the last few years that people are kind of being coming aware of it and the value of it. Okay so uh, I do have some slides, so I should probably uh, try and go through them in that order. So, yeah, so about us, uh, we're a digital agency uh, specialising in, in open source, uh, based over in, in Shoreditch. Um, oh, do you want to? Uh, yeah, that's cool. Okay. okay. Uh, just a little bit about our client. So, we're really pleased to be working with Joe and the Photographers Gallery, implementing open source and new website and CRM here, but working with a number of organisations. <coughs> I think the point about this is that these range from big to small uh, and all ends of it and like the value that it can kind of deliver for all sorts of different organisations. Cool. Okay, so what is open source? Uh, I'll try another question. So we, we had roughly, out of everybody, if you can raise your hand if you kind of think you know what open source is. That's pretty good. I think that's, you know, 70, 75%. So I'm sorry if I'm saying stuff that everybody kind of knows. Um, right, the best way that I can do kind of the explanation of what open source is is to kind of compare it to uh, the opposite, so like a proprietary uh, product, sort of the, the old school. Um, so the most obvious one is kind of like Microsoft Office. Everybody kind of knows Microsoft Office. Um, you buy a license for Microsoft Office. Um, that license allows you generally to kind of install Microsoft Office on a PC. You click a little, uh, you know, you read a document, you click I accept this license agreement. And in that agreement it will say, you're not allowed to reverse engineer kind of Microsoft Office, you're not allowed to, um, you know, kind of make changes to it, you're not allowed to take it to Google and ask them to make changes to it. You're, uh, basically it's a limiting user license and you can only put it on one PC and there's only a few things that you're allowed to, to kind of do with it. Um, open source is still a license, 
um, but it's the opposite. The license is designed to be permissive. So um, the license will say in it things like, yeah, download this software, install it on as many PCs as you want to, or Macs, whatever you want to put it on, um, and uh, make changes to it if you want to make changes to it, reverse engineer it if you want to, uh, if you want to figure out how it all works. Uh, pay somebody to make changes to it, generally, you're able to do that as well, so take it to Google, whoever you want, and they can make changes. Um, generally with one proviso, which is that if you make any derivatives of this software, it should have the same license that the original had. So the idea is that somebody puts something out there for free, which is freely available for people to download, use, and modify, and it stays free for the future of people to be able to download and benefit. And what ends up happening is that you have uh, an open source application uh, that somebody will put out there and communities can develop around it if it's good and if it's use useful. Uh, I think the next slide. Cool. Okay, so where did it come from? Um, so like I said, uh, in around the 1970s there were some you know, bright sparks that were working for I think it's like Bell Laboratories and all these other things. Uh, and they kind of felt really restricted by the fact that you know, their dev team of 10 people, it would have been at the time, couldn't, and they had friends who were working for a dev team for a, you know, a competitor firm. You know, they're the only techies around at the time, and they can't work and collaborate on the same, they're building the same things twice over in different companies. And what ended up happening was that they were looking at a way in which the, they could collaborate on projects without a particular company ending up owning the intellectual property of it. Uh, and then this idea of open source was kind of born. Um, and now, um, what you find is that open source is, is, is really prevalent. Um, so there's a few up here that you probably uh, will hopefully recognise. So Android, uh, everybody's kind of aware of Android. Android's a you know, pseudo open source operating system which is developed, um, you know, or sh the community and the product is developed and shepherded by Google. Um, but there's you know, plenty of other uh, examples. Um, and if I'd switch on to the next one, yeah. So this rather mind-bending graph um, kind of explains, so one of the places that open source tends to be most prevalent has been at the core of uh, internet and web technologies. So it's kind of the stuff that you guys are using every day, but you don't kind of realize that you're using it every day. So what this graph is actually showing you is the blue <coughs> one at the top here is a type of web server, which is kind of the software that makes websites run, uh, known as Apache. Um, and Apache is a big software foundation. They have lots of different projects, one of which is the Apache web server, which is used by, uh, conservatively would say, you know, probably hundreds of millions of websites or something stupid like that. Um, and, you know, 60% of the world's web is kind of, and holding strong at that, is running on kind of Apache web servers. Um, and you can see Microsoft down here with their proprietary, uh, you know, is kind of down in the 10%, um, which, is, which is really interesting to see. And actually, Nginx and, uh, and the others are, are open source, some of the others are open source as well. Um, and this is kind of the field that I'm most interested in, which is the CMS. Uh, so CMS is a content management system. So uh, generally most websites that you are uh, going to these days, they're not static websites made up of one page moved to another page. They're websites where the administrators can log in and dynamically add content, you know, news and things like that, as you would expect. That's the term for a CMS. And what you see here is that uh, all of the big CMSs are open source. So WordPress, Joomla, uh, Drupal, uh, all of the three biggest CMSs are, are open source. Um, what I would say here is that also just for people, uh, most people have heard of WordPress, that's everybody, yeah. So the WordPress stats are a little bit skewed uh, because what you end up having there is quite a lot of single blogs which uh, uh, do increase kind of the number of, of WordPress sites that are kind of out there, but they tend to be very simple blogs compared to Drupal and Joomla sites which are, you know, normally enterprise or a little bit, you know, higher end kind of stuff. Um, cool. So yeah, so uh, relevant technologies for the arts. Um, so what's really happening now is that um, in terms of uh, the, the refresh cycle for websites and, and digital platforms for arts organisations and non-profits, or generally organisations in general, um, 
these are kind of reducing now. You find that in three to five year cycles uh, that people are looking to, to, to refresh their digital platform. And this next cycle of refreshes, um, the open source <coughs> content management systems are becoming the platforms of choice. And this is kind of the first time that this has started to happen at that, uh, that sort of application level where um, the organisations are going out and actively, from, a, uh, from an organisation point of view, saying, actually, we, we understand and we're embracing the idea of open source, because it's a difficult concept to get uh, and to, to navigate their way through. And it's really interesting that Drupal, WordPress and Jira are now getting to the point where they're considered to be the platforms of choice to be on comparatively to the proprietary software. And actually, it's quite interesting. You'll see uh, you know, some organisations will have gone down the route of investing in a proprietary platform, uh, and they almost apologise for it sometimes. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, why Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla? Well, they all have very large and stable communities. And actually, interestingly enough, Drupal and WordPress are backed by very well-funded companies as well. Uh, and what you're starting to see is a kind of a really diverse mixture of business models <coughs> Uh, behind kind of open source communities where there will be a profit making or profit uh, seeking company uh, which is kind of behind the open source community trying to shepherd that through but obviously the benefits are then passed down to the, uh, the smaller organizations which can have lower cost of ownership when they when they kind of join those communities cool. um, so and also city CRM of course this is another one uh, so this is something that I'll talk about a little bit later uh, and the next one that I want to mention and there's also another relevant uh, platform that people should be thinking about potentially which is open data kit this one's a lot less well known and it's a fantastic platform for um, surveys and remote data collection so like you can build an app uh, for data collection uh, which stores it in the app uh, and then when you get kind of connectivity, uh, you're able to kind of uh, then sync that back to kind of an online platform and do like all your analytics with it. So I really like this app, it's really cool. Uh, not most pretty, but cool. Uh, okay, so, you know, what does all of that kind of stuff mean for an organisation in terms of looking at open source? Um, and these are just generally, you know, the advantages that we would talk about from open source. Uh, so. Um, I'll come back to you know kind of the, the cost point, but the software itself is generally free of license costs. So I think every, hopefully everybody's kind of aware of that. This is one of the major benefits of open source. You're able to download it, install it. If you've got 50 users, 100 users, hey, you're not paying per user, and that you know for a lot of organisations is, is a massive top cut, top slice cost saver. Um, the other big benefit is that um, there's no proprietary vendor lock-in. So um, if you were to go out and buy, let's take an, on the CRM side of things, uh, the Razor's Edge, you're invested, you're locked into uh, uh, Blackboard in terms of the services that you can get provided. They're the only people who can provide you with the training, they'll be the only people who can provide you with the software updates. You're locked into one vendor uh, and you've got no flexibility there. Um, the great thing with open source is that you can change vendor person who's pro uh, providing you with your website or technology services without having to change the platform that you're, that you're sitting on. Um, so a huge and growing community of free and paid for add-on modules, so um, because it's open, uh, there's far greater innovation uh, and uh, development kind of going on. So rather than that 150 developer team that's happening in one company, you've got hundreds of developers all around the world trying out different things and coming up with different solutions to problems. Um, and it's community driven development as well, which means that um, rather than having one single uh, organisation with one particular set of goals, like uh, taking the community forwards, you end up with whole different aspects of uh, needs being catered for, uh, depending on who can find a solution for, for what's there. Uh, increased innovation, like I was saying. Uh, and the other one, um, continual free access to upgrades and issue fixes. I put free in, uh, in uh, what do you call it? Uh, co comment. Quotes. 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 Quotes, yes. Free in quotes. Um, so generally open source, will, you know, a new version of the open source product will come out. Uh, unlike with, say, Microsoft Office, where you've got to go and therefore pay for the latest version or the Adobe suite, um, you get free access to, to that latest version. Um, I would say, though, that free you know, is in quotes because sometimes there can be some other costs involved in, in upgrading. 
And one other point that didn't quite make the slide, which is that which is not normally kind of evaluated by people who are thinking about their investment in technology, but is also about the exit costs. Um, so if you do invest in a system, there normally you'll do some sort of total cost of ownership uh, calculation. So trying to work out, you know, what's our capital cost at the beginning, and what do we have to pay annually in order to see what the, the total cost of having the system might be. And one of the numbers that doesn't always make it into that calculation is the exit cost at the end. Um, so what happens when this system does come to end of life and we want to move into something else? Um, when you're working with a proprietary product, sometimes those costs can be really significant. You are locked into somebody else's ecosystem. And if you want to get your data out, it can be very difficult. So if you're on a SaaS platform, sorry, if you're on a, uh, like a software as a service platform, say a Salesforce or something like that, you need to know that you can get your data out in a usable fashion and easily. But open source isn't like some uh, elixir that's going to suddenly make all IT projects run smoothly. Um, I do want to get away from this concept that open source is free. Some people go call it free and open source as being sort of this, uh, you know, the, the terminology to use for it. And I, I kind of feel that that's the, the wrong term um, for it. Open source will take out a, a, a slice of cost for, you know, an investment in an IT system. But generally, IT systems, if you want to do it well and you, you know, you're at a, a certain scale, there's, there's costs involved whatever way you do it. You need to understand you know, what the requirements are from the business. Uh, you need to implement it. You might need to configure, customize. Uh, and of course, you need to train people. Uh, so investing in uh, any uh, system that you invest in, whether it's open source or not, needs to have a, a, enough of a budget to succeed. Uh, and the open source can reduce the need for that budget, but don't, don't think of open source as free. Um, I, oh, I've lost oh, sorry. Yeah. Was I? <laughs> cool. um, and I was going to say, you need to know your way around as well. So open source uh, tends to have communities, and the communities tend to be quite organically developed. So it's, it's really important when you're thinking about investing in, in an open source platform to, to navigate that community and to understand who, uh, who's who in that community and get to know those people and embed yourself in it. And then you can really benefit the most from kind of that open source platform. Um, and the last point is that at the end of the day, code is code. So whether it's written and got an open source license on it or it's got a proprietary license on it, it can be good and bad. So, you know, there will be some examples of proprietary products which are written fantastic and they're really well thought through and they do a great job. Um, there will be some examples of open source where, you know, that might not be the case uh, and vice versa. And it's really important to kind of make the right decision for a technology that you invested in, not just because of the, uh, the enigma of open source being something that you want to go after, um, but, you know, taking all of these factors into account and finding the one that has the best cost benefit for, for your organisation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, cool. So, um, one of the things I want to talk a little bit more about, or somebody's got to tell me when I when I start rabbiting on for too long, uh, is about Sydney CRM. So, um, Compute Corporate, my company, we we started working with Sydney maybe uh, five years ago. It was uh, uh, a small part of what we did back then, uh, and it's now grown into being kind of 70, 80 percent of what we do. In fact, most of what we do is Sydney uh, integrated websites. Um, so, Civi is an open source CRM, uh, customer relationship management system, constituent relationship management, contact relationship management, anything that begins with a C, carrot relationship management, apparently. Um, so, um, what makes Civi different? Everybody's kind of, I don't have to explain what a CRM is, do I? Or is it like fundraising database for some people, membership management system, you know, all about people and understanding, uh, you know, how they're interacting with your organisation. Um, so what makes Civi different? So obviously it's got this USP, which is that it, it's open source, so it's free to download and, and use. Um, but one of the special things about it, and probably because it's open source, is that it is designed to integrate into the three biggest or most prevalent open source content management systems, those are the websites, um, that are available. So Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress that we spoke about before. So it's actually designed as a plugin or a module, whatever you want to call it, for those three platforms. Um, and what does that mean? Well, unlike a situation where you've got a separate CRM and uh, a website, and then you have to pay someone lots of money to try and get the two to talk to each other, the two are already talking. They're on the same platform. When you're logged into one, you're logged into the other. Uh, 
And what does this mean, you know, in terms of kind of like the delivery? Well, it allows us to do lots of cool stuff. Uh, it makes it very easy for us to get the data from the CRM integrated to the site. So, you know, event listings, online donations, sign-up forms, all of that kind of stuff is very easy to do because the two are kind of joined on the same platform. Um, and then also we can do some more complicated stuff. So we can do full self-service portals, uh, uh, fundraising pages. So I might dive into that depending on how much time I've got. No? Yeah. <laughs> No. Uh, yep, next one. Yep. Uh, oh, right. slides are in the wrong order. There you go. That's a bit. Um, uh, so, what does Sydney have included in it? Uh, just very quickly, uh, supports kind of donor management for fundraising, uh, membership management, so uh, people coming along having uh, subscriptions and membership. Uh, events, so you can set up events a bit like you might go through Eventbrite, uh, very similar kind of setup, you can set up events, complicated pricing and all of that kind of stuff, discounts on events, uh, some quite cool stuff with that. Uh, surveys and petitions, uh, so Civi's got a built in uh, survey uh, kind of module, you can also do some very cool stuff on the Drupal platform using something called web forms uh, to do kind of really complicated multi page collecting sort of information for people. Uh, Email newsletter SMS, so it's got built in uh, sort of like MailChimp equivalent, but it also will uh, integrate with MailChimp if you, there's some plugins and things like that. For that. Uh, and integrated reporting as well, so built in reporting tools. Uh, and yeah, thanks. Uh, and also the one that made the last slide, because I couldn't fit it on the other slide, uh, cases as well. Uh, so probably not so much for arts organisations, non profits. We're doing a very big project with Health Watch England, the people who worry about making sure that all hospitals are doing the right thing. They're rolling out Civi in 130 uh, local health watches, so that's a, a really big thing. That's all about kind of case management and understanding the steps that are going through there. Cool. Um, yeah, I do, uh, do I want to dive in and maybe show? I was going to show some, you guys some stuff with it. How long have I got? No, shall I stop? Yeah. Okay, shall I flick it? Okay, <laughs> cool. So there, there are lots of cool sites that have done lots of cool things that uh, integrate the website. And these are like a couple of them that I thought would be relevant for another time. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, flick through this okay. one. Cool. And I think what's really interesting is that um, it seems to be that open source is much more prevalent in charities. That they, as opposed to arts, and I know that Ruth is actually going to say something completely. Well, it's brilliant because you're already there. You're already using open source. But I think that's one thing that I really noticed that so many charities are using open source for everything, and the art world has barely even heard of it. I mean, everyone here has, but and they're not using. I mean, the industry, if you like, if there is an industry, isn't really using it at the minute, which is really weird. I think it's, it's, it's a case that um, the, the refresh cycle for yeah. the different platforms uh, is slightly different. So for the websites, uh, the three to five year uh, refresh cycle, that's kind of happening at the moment where people are going from their previous, whatever you call them, web two kind of websites, where they kind of look like normal websites, uh, and then moving on to now this kind of more immersive kind of experience website. Um, the CRM refresh, is a lot longer so you know it, it's so important to the organization the data that's actually going through there and it's very difficult to kind of make that switch it's, it's, it's a big switch you've got to deal with a lot of data you know process uh, re-engineering and, and, and training a lot of people rather than just the, the comms team uh, so those are moving slower um, and what's interesting to see now is that this this key kind of requirement about bringing the website and the CRM together into <coughs> one platform is kind of this big driver now for change where lots of organisations are seeing how they're, how are we going to be able to solve this. Um, and Civi is, you know, it's, it's just gone from being kind of a very, uh, you know, small community to now almost, I think it's like 9,000 organisations worldwide are using it uh, and growing now into the art, arts world as well. That's quite exciting. Cool. Uh, I don't know if I've got any slides left. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very thank much. You very thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, and thank you for inviting me. And if I'd paid Jamie, he couldn't have set my uh, talk up better. Uh, we only met five minutes before the talk, but it's really, but really nice. It it just means I've got a lot of explaining that I don't have to do. And, uh, and what a great start. I, here I am disagreeing with you right from the start by talking about free and open source software. And 
I kind of I included this because when we talk about uh, the free bit of the free and open source software, we're talking about a uh, political philosophy, not about things being cost free. So this is about uh, licensing for freedom of expression and uh, freedom to continue to distribute and share, which actually is completely in agreement with you, Jamie. And I. Free, I, beer, not free, is it? free as in free speech rather than free beer is the nice way of thinking about it. Um, so FOSS stands for free and open source software. And I'm going to give a kind of two pronged uh, approach to this. Uh, I am an artist and I'm co-founder and co-director of Furtherfield and I'll give you a very brief introduction to what we do just so you have the context. But I'm going to talk about this from two angles. Uh, why free and open source software is, uh, why, why we use it and why it's important for us uh, and our organisational infrastructure and, and also why, uh, why we also advocate for its use in the development of projects that have a kind of digital element. Um, so Furtherfield uh, got going in the mid 90s uh, by my set. It was founded by myself and Mark Garrett, who's also an artist. Uh, as it, in the mid 90s, as Brit art was really getting going in London, and also as the web was was had kind of taken off as a public space that anyone could publish to, and a space that you could shape yourself. Uh, it felt, the web felt like a very exciting space for us at that time because we understood it, we started to understand it as a space that allowed you to connect with people from around the world with shared interests and it, it, it kind of natural, provided a natural counterbalance to the kind of closing down of culture that we experienced through the whole Brit art thing. So while galleries and the attention of the media for art might be closing down, the internet allowed us to engage with really uh, kind of what, what felt like current and important uh, social and political discussions and artists who were also interested in that. Um, so now Furtherfield is a gallery and a lab and an online community. Uh, and our uh, focus is on arts, technology and social change. Uh, so we've been online since 97. Our community is made up of uh, both practitioners and theorists, so thinkers and doers, who are artists, techies and activists. And this, the, our online space is a really co-created space by the people who we've worked with now for nearly 20 years. Um, this is a just to give you a sense of our physical location, this is a picture of our gallery uh, right in the heart of Finsbury Park, so that's four stops north from uh, King's Cross. I hope you'll come and visit us. And here we've been, uh, we've been curating between three and five exhibitions a year of artists and techies and activists who are interested in how art and technology help people to think critically about the social effects of technology, about what digital, how digital culture is changing the way we relate to each other, the way power moves, and also our relationship with the environment. So, so kind of a very uh, grounded sense of art, art as, it, as it is meaningful to as many and diverse people as possible. Uh, the common space is a newish space and it's a lab for people to experiment with making things and really get their hands dirty and to start to understand how they might shape their own technologies and make the devices work for them and their communities in an interesting way. Um, and I, I, it seemed important to me that I should show you this slide. Okay, so Daiwo, uh, that stands for do it with others. Uh, this we understood as moving, uh, moving on from the idea of the artist as an individual genius who sits in a kind of closeted space honing their talent into a space where we are all hyper-connected and that the network space of the internet really put all these different categories of people and groups and organisations and things and tools into connection with each other, which really changed our sense of what 
the social space was for art and also what the medium for art was. It kind of really meant that art, art took place in a very social space. And I've put this in because I think it helps to contextualise why we moved into, uh, quite early into kind of working, seeing our work alongside the work of uh, open source culture as it developed. So here, just to explain how I read this image, so this is an, an image of a, a network that connects up tools, like artistic tools, like a camera and a hand drawing and a, a, a couple and a group. And here we have a symbol, a really uh, tacky and inefficient symbol for grassroots down here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have, we have the philosopher up at the top, who I always think of Nan, as Nanjun Pike. I don't know if that name means anything to you. And uh, down here we have the hysteric and a uh, talking dildo, which is our uh, nod to the role that pornography played in the growth of the internet. So it's this idea of a network is very kind of rich, rich kind of interconnected and a space of feeling. Um, and I just wanted to talk about openness as well. And this, I made this image uh, in 2006 when Furtherfield was involved in an early media arts festival called Node London. And uh, Node stand, stood for Networked Open Distributed Events. And it was a kind of... It, I could still feel the pain. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a festival organised by thirty organisations, eighty people, taking the idea of a kind of distributed, non-hierarchical, consensual organisation model, inspired by kind of early utopian sense of what the internet was, and built around ideas of openness that kind of crossed these three different cultures. So it crossed the cultures of art engineering and, act and activism it whilst it still i can still feel the stab in my heart it it was nevertheless an amazing thing which made a lot of organizations and artists and techies and activists visible to each other and formed relationships that are still very powerful and important actually in the life of this work in london and i wanted the reason i put it up is because this is this slide is about uh, the, the joys and horrors of collaboration across discipline. Uh, the reason why there's three cups of tea is because as long as we're sitting around the table having a cup of tea together, we still like each other and we're still making the effort to try and understand each other. And uh, openness to artists, we, we understand this as kind of participatory process, open systems, uh, open exhibitions, open studios. Engineer in, in software development, openness means something very technical. It has a technical <coughs> precision to it, which is all the things that uh, Jamie described earlier. And in activism, it's also got this political element. So it's about open organisation, raising global awareness, ideas of uh, transparency, and a kind of shared raising of global consciousness. And I just put this up because... If you, go in, if you go in knowing that when, when I say open, that puts a completely different idea in somebody's head, then you're kind of prepared to kind of have a conversation and, and, and uh, accept that you are going to misunderstand each other quite a lot. And this, uh, it, it, it was a very fruitful, if slightly painful, experience. And go and check out Node London. I think it was still a really interesting and valuable kind of experiment. And I think something may happen again along those lines. Um, OK, so now I'm going to talk very practically. I'm going to give the kind of uh, practical demonstrator of, uh, that proves that everything that Jamie just said is true. Um, so. Uh, why free and open source software for organisational infrastructure? Um, I'm going to give a little case study, which is a project that Furtherfield and Drake Music... So Drake Music is a charity who work with assistive technologies, working with people who experience uh, a kind of disabling barriers to music. And we work with them to pilot this project called WeShare, where we develop shared web infrastructure. Um, the problem was, was that uh, times had changed. Uh, back when we first started in the late 90s, we worked 
on a very even basis with techies who wanted to work with us because we could provide them with test audiences who could see what they were doing, test it out, make it stronger, make it more robust. But as time went on, the things that the techies became much more on demand and we were left with systems that were actually quite cutting edge. So we had things like blogging systems and commenting systems really before these things were kind of mainstream but they were getting harder and harder to maintain. And the people who designed the system, great, imaginative, very kind of dedicated people, but they were being paid much more money than we could ever afford to pay them to maintain and to keep de developing things. Um, and so these were, they were coming out of date, inflexible and clunky to maintain. And we end, it ended up that we were locked out of our own system. So this is just backing up what J Jamie was saying. We couldn't kind of get to do the work that we needed to do to develop our own system. And kind of by this stage, so by 2010, we felt that the best of our content and the life of our communities were hidden. And a lot of our content is produced by the participants in our community. Uh, we needed sustainable, which me meant affordable, access to the best tech know-how and tools and also to share expertise, resources and experience about online community building kind of amongst, among, between our organisations. So, uh, you see what I mean, Jamie? I'm just kind of saying it's, it's all the reasons. Uh, okay, so what he said is true. Um, do, doing this work, so by working with, with other organisations, we were able to focus on our artistic missions, actually to bring the life of our communities up to the surface for, for them to get to be in the right place somehow. And we built a shared web, web infrastructure using Drupal, which is uh, free and open source, which has this free and open source community uh, building software. We shared designers, technical development teams, and we shared server facilities. Uh, yes, we think there's more scope for consortia approaches as well between arts organisations. And I think, yeah, Paula's sitting at the back there. Hi, Paula. Uh, Paula is, uh, runs Fossbox, who did the technical development for us recently on a CIVI CRM uh, development. And this was a consortia with Arts Catalyst, Invisible Dust, and Electra. And it's, uh, it's not easy, but, and, and one reason why I would recommend consortia approach, approaches is because there's a lot of work to be done by arts organisations and just getting their head around what things mean and, and what's important and understanding what things are going to be important to go forward. So th th that kind of sharing of best practice and understanding what your shared needs are really early on can really help you move faster towards knowing what it is that you're going to want. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about why uh, free and open source software for artistic projects and I'm going to use as a case study here, uh, Play Your Place. Uh, we've always, since we got going, Furtherfield has always developed software platforms uh, that are also artworks somehow. And I think, again, this is about understanding that in the networked age, uh, that art is an art of social relations. So we make software that then create certain kinds of relationships between people. And Play Your Place is uh, one, of the mo one of our most recent projects. Uh, it's an open artwork and online game building game. It's created by artists, programmers and citizens broadly uh, to develop a collective vision for richer emancipated lives for all beings in all places. Okay, so uh, a, a small ambition. Um, it was made by, uh, devised by me and Mary Flanagan. This is us both here. And the reason I put this up is because it came out of a discussion, a really odd moment. Mary was on uh, residency. I put this in because it's a project that came out of, of a very kind of traditional artistic context, basically. So oh, but Mary was on residency at Metal, a great uh, arts organisation based in South End. And she was presenting some work about a smart city that was being built in Korea, I think by Microsoft. I've, I've probably got the details a bit wrong here. But it was, a, it was an artwork that was taking a critical look at this very kind of, this idea that technology can save us, basically. And she was, she was focusing on the kind of eerie and uncanny feelings that this might, you know, 
a, a new town built where if you fall over, then the ambulance will be called automatically because the floor can fill the, uh, the kind of unhealthy thud. And so she'd been looking at those things. And this sparked a conversation, a row, actually, between the residents of uh, South End and local planners and local councillors <coughs> about processes for planning processes. And this kind of unlocked a really wide and interesting discussion about um, the problems there are associated with public consultation processes around local planning issues. And Mary and I had a... So the argument was that there's loads of developments done that don't really have the support of the community, that uh, a lot of the survey and consultancy processes are tokenistic, bureaucratic, they benefit people who like filling out forms and really do we want to have our world decided by people who like filling out forms. So it's this kind of bureaucratisation of, of a, collective, a collective experience. And uh, Mary and I had a kind of gobby moment and said, oh, well, you just need to draw on participatory processes. Artists know how to do that. Game, uh, game development, Mary knew how to do that. And free and open source software, which I'm kind of evangelical about. And then this project took <coughs> off because they said, all right, then come on, you can solve it. Show us how it's done. So um, we worked with local residents to design games to model change and we used the platform game as the model uh, we mary and i've worked together before and um, i think we understand that um, using familiar forms means that many people can get involved very quickly so it doesn't require an awful lot of explanation and it's also a very moral format, the platform game. So there's obstacles, there's rewards, there's punishments and treats. And we like things that have these kind of clear moral outcomes. And so here's some early development work that we did with the local people in South End. And Alex is showing up her drawing of uh, Avatar settings and says that she'd like to see more equal access to primary schools, whereas David would like them to stop making the wrong people redundant. And so the, the reason I put these images in is because what we're doing with the artistic projects very often is, is actually modelling quite a lot of these processes for uh, a kind of co-construction and co-creation co -creation processes that are also in the, in the software development. And we're doing them with people and kind of working out what it means that it, if you involve people in ideas about the way the world might be better for all of us. Um, we created a free browser-based game that you can build with others and then play and then share. And this was uh, free and open source software developed with Soda. And pub we, this was published on uh, GitHub as free and open source software in 2013. Uh, people decide what's most important. They draw the elements uh, and then build the game. So. They upload their drawings as backgrounds, obstacles and rewards, and then they can edit the games and edit the great game rules. So it's a real kind of world-building, value-building. And when you create a game, someone else can come and use their drawings in your game to improve it. So it's a, a real co-constructive process. Uh, I'm showing you now a couple of screenshots from uh, some of the games we made. This was, a, this was the one that most pleased me from uh, the games we made in South End. Uh, made by a group who called themselves the Tory Town Poets, and uh, this was called One Stan Army, and it was it was a it was a cry of uh, a cry of a rallying cry to to become more politically active in in South End. Uh, we also then ran this in a number of places. So uh, we ran it in Westminster, and. This, this particular game, I'm going to show you one game, not this one. This game was called Dog Snog, and it was a game... We, we made this in Westminster, and I really loved it because it was a game where people really did say what was important to them. And for some people in South Westminster who faced many, many challenges, uh, economic, social, all kinds of things, when you ask them what, how the world could be improved, they say, we could treat our animals better. And uh, so this was one of the games that was produced out of this, and this was a game in which you lick the people in order to find a loving home for yourself as a dog. 
So it's something that very kind of warm. This one, okay, I'm going to show you this game, a video of this game, and th then I'm nearly finished. So in this game, this came out of conversations about how in South Westminster, um, the problem of property speculation, even, even in relation to social housing, was pushing the prices of rent up so much that key workers, uh, key workers were being pushed out, um, the local nurseries closing, even the local pubs that used to have uh, pianos in them and people used to gather around, you, they can see the kind of community being killed. And so in this game, uh, you grab the cash to kill the spirit of community. And I'm just going to play you. So that I'm showing you this so you can get a sense of what it actually looks like. So this is a game sample, a video game sample, just so you can see how these games, what they, what they, an example of how they look. Okay, so uh, I can't remember whether she's won there or not. But if you if you grab all the cash, you end up with a beautiful mansion, <laughs> and and complete. Uh, other than that, a completely empty world. Um, okay, that's nothing to do with me. Um, We made another version which I'm not going to talk about other than to say it happened uh, working with South Bank Centre as part of their Web We Want Fest. So we asked people to think about the future of the web and what they would like. And this, this is just an example of, of this, the kind of setup. So it was kind of big public drawing processes and a lot of conversation about all the complexities. When you actually start to try and think about what you, what the things that you value and the things that ought to be different, then all the complexities that this throws, throws up. So, um, working with free and open source software for artistic projects, the thing that we noticed was that participants really appreciated that their creative work contributed to a wider social project, so that everything that they did was also feeding into the software that would then be used by other people. And that, people really valued that. They felt that they were contributing something, so they were investing a lot of imagination into a process, but they knew that it wasn't, got, that they weren't going to be locked out of it, that it was something that would then be moved forward and used by other people. The software license and ethos means that no one can be locked out of the fruits of their own work. So that's us as artists, artists devisers, the developers and the participants. It builds a network of participants and partners with very diverse interests. And it, I think most, uh, the, the kind of key point for us was that it supported really ambitious development. So because we worked with Soda, as usual, as an arts, arts project, it had very little money. But they developed some really beautiful software that they wouldn't have been able to do if, if they were just giving, if we were buying their services, because then they would be locked out of their own software. So by, we were able to do something really complex that they, they can then take that and do whatever they like with it. But the project, the initial project is still ours, but they can build on all the things that they did with us. So it meant that it was a lot more ambitious than it would have been otherwise. And this is my final slide. So just a kind of summary, why free and open source software? So better partnerships in art and tech, sustainable, by which I mean affordable and flexible, so you can kind of do more with it. Uh, it builds trust and you share innovations rather than endlessly uh, reinventing the wheel to come back to what Jamie was saying and to harness the co-creative energies to get, have more diverse people involved and to stay involved. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, that's me. I'm Faye. I'm uh, well known within the Wikimedia communities for, at the moment, working on images. I'm doing some video and other things. And working on, I mean, releasing them. So I'm a, I'm a liberator of content from all sorts of organisations. And in the last few years, I've worked with people like the, the British Library and the British Museum and 
all these grand institutions, which has been really fantastic. Uh, Joe re referenced the, uh, the Wellcome Trust yeah. and the Wellcome Image Library two and a half, three years ago released a very large collection of images about medical history, which included all sorts of things, Chinese medicine, all, you know, going way back and uh, up until um, AIDS education posters, which were very interesting from around the world. Um, uh, and I released all of those, but it, I had two years of discussion first while they went from non-commercial to actually making them all completely free. So you could stick it on a T-shirt and sell a T-shirt if you wanted. They were very worried about that. And of course, as soon as you mention lawyers, everybody clamps down. And that's, that's the big issue, I think, for all of our institutions. As soon as someone mentions copyright and lawyers, everybody wets themselves a little bit and nobody can make a decision. Well, that's been my experience. And I don't really care. I'm like, well, I'll come back in two years and I'll liberate your content when, you're, when you know what, you're, what you want to do with it. Um, and I've also, uh, my background, uh, I helped set up the, the UK charity Wikimedia in the UK, which, um, which you had a logo on your, your as yeah, a user of CBC, CBCRM, yeah. uh, which we found very difficult to use. It takes a lot of effort. Anyway, <laughs> um, that's my little critical <laughs> feedback. But it's great because it's free. So, uh, so yeah. yeah. But, but and you, and, and you, and you said, that and, yeah. and, that, and that's the thing is that um, there is a problem with making stuff free. You know, you can release your catalogue, you can release your content. If, if you're representing a large institution, you can stump, shove stuff on your website. And uh, when I first started talking to the British Library about three years ago, um, their website, they admitted it was a bit of a mess, it was confusing, it was enormous, had lots of content, which was very interesting, I found absolutely fascinating. But every image had copyright trustees, British Library. And it took about a year for them to, and I had to sit down with the, their, their copyright team, and we had lunch, and they said, we, yeah, we want to change this, uh, we know it's silly. And and one of the key advantages of them all talking to me was that I wasn't paid by anybody and I wasn't representing anyone. I was just this weird advocate who was you know, not representing any software system or anything else. Um, and I'm, my interest was the content. And what I found very strange was then talking to the curators inside the organisation, who all said, I had one of, the, one of their, their leading curators hand me, try to hand me CDs with content trying to get me to release this stuff. And I said, well, I'd rather have the institution behind them. And eventually we got there, uh, you know, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's frustrating for everybody, including the people inside the organisation. We'll probably come back to one of those. Let's have a real slide. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the foundation before we get to the real, real slides. So that's slide nine as well. We've, mentioned, we've sort of talked a bit about the software. Um, uh, I found it quite interesting to observe UK government. UK government a few years ago now introduced the um, open government license and suddenly instead of talking about crown copyright we're talking about releasing stuff truly public domain with a weird slight twist to it because they want attribution that's the only difference between open government license and public domain um, uh, it took several years of discussion and the organization that i was part of was part of i gave testimony testimony to a joint committee on, on that so uh, it was all heavy stuff it took years it eats up volunteers, it eats up employees too to change the opinions of government. It's a real painful and difficult process. And I think their, their key document was 270 pages. I was one of the few people that ever read it, I think. You know, so this, this hard work, um, even for employees, for volunteers, it's impossibly hard work you when know, you're not being paid. And local government is a, is a mishmash. A lot of local government organisations would like to release stuff. They're worried. They're worried about privacy. They're worried about data. They're worried about the law. And they don't want to pay their solicitor for advice. Um, uh, so dribs and drabs get out. But they're being pushed by the big government people. Universities are a bit easier. We're <coughs> gradually working around publishers. Um, there's an understanding of Creative Commons licences, which is helping. Uh, there's this sector, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, I enjoy working with the organisations, wonderful content, um, but as I've said, we've always got to work around the lawyers. And there are these organisations like the one I've been involved with, Wikimedia, which runs Wikipedia, and there are these other organisations that I've also talked to from time to time, <coughs> like, like Flickr and Google, which are sort of open and closed at the same time. Flickr is open and closed at the same time, they've actually got Creative Commons licences. There are institutions that release their content on Flickr very successfully, uh, it's really quite good at that on, on the commons. I work with the London School of Economics. They use their Flickr stream, release their content. 
using copyright, uh, we don't know the copyright, there's a special license for that, um, and you can put it out there and you sort of reuse it at your own risk and we sort of sit around worrying about that. Creative Commons that I work on quite a lot, we take that license and we pretend it's public domain, but it's kind of a bit unknown. So London School of Economics, very courageous, was there, as an early one that put it out there. And there are these systems, Android and Linux, we've already mentioned. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about four challenges for the future of the internet and the creative community. There's only four words you need to take away. This is the first one. It's big. That's a really difficult challenge. Um, what does this pie chart tell you? It's a big blue thing. What is it? That's Facebook, right? This is, this is me trying to size how many photographs are out there on the internet that we might reuse, right? Facebook is the right mishmash. I get lots of images from Facebook put on Wikimedia Commons. The people who load it there, they don't understand copyright, that you have to fill in the form and release the copyright. You've got to do that every user one at a time. Flickr uh, is actually red on this graph. These are, I can, you can actually measure this. You go on to Flickr, and you can look at the different types of licenses. And the ones that are truly free here is Creative Commons uh, uh, by license. And um, you can see the red line on this chart. That's in proportion to Facebook. Because every day, Facebook, people use their mobile phones and they upload loads of rubbish. Here's another picture of my cat. Here's what I had for breakfast. That's what goes out on Facebook. Uh, people use Flickr quite a lot for blogging. And some of them release them as free. So you can use that, but it's, in terms of proportion of Facebook, it's tiny, let's have the next, next chart, because that chart kind of doesn't make any sense. This is a, the same chart, the same data, but shown as each one in relation to each other as a magnitude, so it's a nice logarithmic pie chart. Um, and but as the numbers don't really mean something, when you talk about trillions, I can assure you, having uploaded 100,000 images from the Welcome Library, it's very hard for anybody else to appreciate how many that is. Um, any, anybody here in control of, of, uh, of 100,000 images or more? No? Oh, I thought some people would be. But, uh, it's really, really big. And in, fact, in fact, most projects talk about maybe 10,000 is normally where you get to, goodness, this is a big collection. When you get to 100,000, nobody really knows what it is. When you talk about 15 million, which is what the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, someone at the Cyber Science Museum wants to release, quite a large collection. And when you're talking about something like 15 million, what the hell is that? I don't know. And uh, within the Wellcome Trust, there are research groups, and they have um, huge collections of images, that are research, research images, you know, scans of flies and things. You know. Well, uh, we've got 15,000 of that species of fly, and we've got another 10,000 of that, and together we're talking about a trillion gigabytes or whatever it is. It's ridiculously large numbers. Um, now, Wikimedia Commons up there, re uh, I think last week passed 25 million images, uh, which in proportion to all these things seems tiny. However, even that would need one year for you to look at them all if you looked at them all 24 hours a day, one every second. Um, so that means a human being cannot review those. Um, it would be very difficult to pay someone to review the licensing of all of those. Um, do we know what content is there? No one can be responsible. And the Wikimedia Foundation certainly don't want to be responsible for what people upload to Wikimedia Commons. You know, if you want to look at a picture of somebody's willy, you can do that on Wikimedia Commons. You can find them. And we don't vet them or censor them. We don't know how many there are, really, because we're very reliant on, on users categorising these things and telling us what they are. Uh, so there's quite a challenge. And if you can imagine Facebook, wow, they've got loads of defamatory and difficult and illegal images They've got, you know, pictures of people being blown up and beheaded and all, that, all sorts of things. Um, they don't want to be responsible for their own content. They're never going to tell you that it's free. They're never going to license it. Uh, in 70 years' time, it'll be public domain because copyright would have expired. So in 70 years' time, who's going to be curating through all of that? And which digital archaeologist is going to go through it? And where's it even going to be? And... Uh, that, so that's the size problem. We've done size. It's really, really big. No answers. And that's, that's the four challenges. There aren't any answers to them. Copy fraud. Who's heard of copy fraud? Nobody been to a presentation on copy fraud? Must be a wiki thing. Um, this beautiful document um, is actually medically related to the text, but it wasn't released by the Welcome. Uh, it isn't actually free and available anywhere, apart from on this slide, which I've made it public domain now. And the reason is, uh, this is held by the Vatican Library, 
Um, it's a 16th century document, early 16th century. Um, uh, it was donated to the Vatican, I think in 1902. The Vatican believe that they can say, you can see there's a watermark here, just about you can see, they put a watermark of all, all rights reserved on this 16th century document. Anybody who believe the Pope owns this and he has copyright? Does God own this? I don't know. Anyway. So that, that's the difficulty is that if I wanted to put this in my book um, and I was writing about uh, the Barberini manuscripts, um, I would worry. I would then have to write to the Vatican Library and try and get permission. And you know what? They'd say no because their lawyers aren't sure. Uh, I'm releasing this to public domain. You can have it if you want, because it's stupid otherwise, isn't it? I don't need a lawyer. I can also do that because I'm an unpaid volunteer. I don't represent anybody. I can tell you it's public domain. If I represented an institution, I couldn't tell you that, could I? How bizarre. What a bizarre world we're in. Let's have the next one. Uh, less beautiful image, but very interesting in terms of British history. Here's an image from the Royal Observer Corps, taken to taken in the, uh, during the Second World War. Um, I uploaded lots of images from the Pier of War Museum, uh, the same, uh, in fact, shortly after uh, the death of Aaron Schwartz, um, who committed suicide after being a attempted prosecution for misusing a system for uploading free images, uh, which turned out to be an American court case. And to mark that, I, after some years of discussion with the Imperial War Museum trying to release their collections, I personally gave up on them and I just uploaded them. And uploaded 50,000 images from their site, which probably made them a bit annoyed. Some of the staff within their organisation probably were quite happy. Uh, they release images at 800 pixels wide. Uh, they release them as not on a special non-commercial licence. Um, but it's nonsense because Crown, this is Crown copyright expired under the new government rules. The government owns this, not the Imperial War Museum. Um, and in fact, the, by the government, I mean we own it, of course, because we paid for it. We paid for the Imperial War Museum to take the nation's archive. Um, so we established that in 1919 uh, by a government act. Um, and they, they hold this stuff for us. But, they, but they're busy locking it away from us. And in fact, since I uploaded this image, I uploaded this original image two years ago, um, they now only make it available watermarked in Pira War Museum, which is slightly, again, slightly odd. Why are they watermarking public assets? And they're only missing 800 pixels, which you see a lot on a lot of websites. And unfortunately, this means that if I want to know what is this thing that they're using here and what's this printed on it, it's very, some of you can probably make out this word. Anybody read that? Watford. It is Watford. It's actually very, it's much harder to see it from here than it is from the um, That's it, uh, that should, which gone in at 250%. But public domain, they say, you, if you, you have to pay us £7.50 if you want the high-resolution one. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the high-resolution one. <laughs> um, I, I, paid, I paid nothing for this. Uh, so that, that's at 5,700 pixels wide, but it's only a half of it. It's that tiny bit of detail. And now I can stand here and read. It says Watford Centre, number 17. It says something else. There's all these lovely numbers on it, and they're lining up, and they're... They're trying to do something, whatever the Royal Observer Corps were doing in their observations back then. What lovely data for, for someone doing, going through the digital archives. Yeah. Um, now, remember, I've got 50,000 images like this from the Imperial War Museum, which I just took, I wrote to them and I, at that time, and I said, I intend to do this. Tell me if I'm doing anything illegal. And, of course, their IP lawyer wrote back and, and didn't really say anything. They said, well, we, we have put a lot of work into these. And I said, yes, but if I make them free, is it illegal? You make them free on your website, can I just take them? And they couldn't give me a proper answer. I intend to pursue this, which is, can I take the full resolution version just systematically from your site, which I could. Um, I don't want to do that without the permission, because I'd like to push their IP lawyer just a little bit further, mm -hmm. and I'll probably write to all their board of trustees, who'd probably be a bit worried at the, the sort of bad rep they're getting by locking everything away. And, trying to, and what annoys me is that when I talk to academics, they have this question, I want to put this in my book. This very image, somebody wrote to me and said, how did, how did you get a version without the watermark on it? Can I get a high resolution version? So I gave them the high resolution version, and this is now uh, available on Wikimedia Commons. I haven't done it for all of them. And that last slide, I, I, I estimate I have to pay the Imperial War Museum £37,000 to upload all of those high, high resolution. It's only 10% of what the collection is. 
Um, and it's pointless because it still wouldn't be free. It'd still be, I'd then be under a contract not to make it free and available. And I don't want to enter a contract like that. That's all. So that's, that's copy fraud, which is where institutions like your institutions think they can control their assets by using copyright. But of course, you know what? In the long term, everything's free. Copyright is only 70 years at the moment. Maybe the government will turn it to something else. But uh, in the long term, it's definitely all free. And I love going, looking at the 19th century and earlier archives, like the Vatican, and saying, well, that's all free, isn't it? I can take what I like. No one's going to really argue with you. Uh, do we all know who this man is? Uh, good. Um, anybody know what I'm going to talk about with persistence? No. Uh, this photograph is only available at this resolution, which isn't a great resolution. It looks all right on a, on a slide, but it's not great. Of all my uploads, I've uploaded uh, three quarters of a million images to Wikimedia Commons. This upload is my second most popular Flickr a sourced image. So I took this from a Flickr stream. This is from the London School of Economics. And um, I took it from their stream, which they nicely released it. But it's actually a photograph of Nelson Mandela when he came to talk at the NSC in the year 2000. It's, it's very, very popular. Uh, uh, slightly sadly, my most popular image is a photograph of somebody's breakfast. Uh, uh, apparently, a cooked breakfast is very popular as an image to use on the internet. Uh, next slide. This shows you how popular this image is. Uh, this is me this week doing a Google search. Google have a nice image search uh, function. Across the internet, this image, probably because I put it on Wikimedia Commons, because it not being anywhere else, is now reused in all these places. And this is, the, this is a key problem that we have no solution for. Is, and a lot of institutions are very worried, the Wellcome Trust and other people are very worried about this. They release their content, they're very happy to make their free contract freely available as part of their public domain mission or the public mission on. Um, but they say, well, if someone then goes to this, this blog where someone's put this on their site and they've just ripped it and they've made their own version of it, how will anybody find that, that we were the people that originally released it and we have the original catalogue entry and we have the explanation of when Nelson Mandela was at you know, this is all of that. How do you keep that with the image? I've got no idea. We haven't got any solution to that. So we're looking for a nice solution. Uh, there are lots of projects going on to try and find a better solution. Uh, Google's image search is quite nice, but you know it's not free, it's not open. Um, I, I've tried to build tools around this by sort of cheating a little bit. I can do it, but I can only do it at the rate of something like a thousand an hour or something. And actually I'm bending the rules. I should really get a commercial license. I should pay Google something ridiculous like £600 a month or something. You know. And even then I'm still limited. So, you know, if, if anybody from Google is watching... You know, please give me a free license and I can pl play with my tools a little bit better you know, for good public purpose. But how do we keep the metadata with the image? Um, and I drill into this, this particular one example. Again, my most popular uh, Flickr image. Um, it's not my most pop popular uh, picture of a person. Um, but we have, have the data we want to keep with it is when it was taken, it was actually uploaded at a different time. It was uploaded in 2009 um, by the London School of Economics. So the actual data that goes in the image makes it look like it's 2009. So automatic data starts to give you wrong information back. Uh, the LSC, since I've uploaded it, have removed it from their site. I don't know why. Um, uh, it's no longer on Flickr. The permanent URL that the London School of Economics gave it that I referred to no longer exists. <coughs> Um, the, the data that was with the image, uh, photographs have this stuff called EXIF data, sometimes it's called other stuff, and that's data that they tuck at the bottom of the file that uh, tells you about the date and so forth, and sometimes the geo position of your camera at the time when it was taken, all that sort of thing, and what your camera was. Um, uh, actually, is dummy data, it's actually really rubbish that comes with the image that I uploaded. Um, and currently, in terms of public interest, it's available on 89 different Wikipedia articles in 10 different languages, which is quite good reach. So actually, this is the one that illustrates Nelson Mandela in Spanish and Russian, you know, so, which is quite interesting. Okay. My last topic, I'm, am I on time? Yeah, yeah. Just about, good. just about on time. Okay. The last topic is uh, an equally difficult one, so we've had, it's really big. We've had copy fraud, which nobody had heard of. Take away the word copy fraud and use it in a meeting. Right. Really interesting. Because uh, people talk about copyright, you can say, have we thought about copy fraud? Uh, persistence, that's the metadata, persistence, persisting with the image. And 
this is a really difficult one that we keep, keep talking about the volunteer community that I work with, we talk about all the time, and that is we upload lots of stuff and people moan at me because I've uploaded hundreds of thousands of images and people say, God, you've uploaded a load of crap. You know, what is all of that? And I've uploaded, for example, from the... Uh, uh, Americans are very good. If you're on a federal project, all of your material becomes public domain by, you know, by, by government act. Better than the British in this regard. Um, so I uploaded from the National Park Service some surveys that were done from the 19th century through to the current time of all of the parks, which is very much like the National Trust in America. Um, uh, all of, all of, they have lovely survey photographs of landscapes and buildings. I uploaded 290,000 photographs, mostly in black and white. And of course, a lot of other volunteers have problems about these old black and white images. Who's going to use them? Actually, they're incredibly valuable for looking at uh, what's happened to uh, buildings and places that have changed over time. So a photograph from 1960 of this building, same building still there, that's great. I've got some very nice examples of photographs taken in the 1980s in New York, and the buildings have since been redeveloped. Uh, so they've been knocked down, and these were wonderful examples of a certain period in the 1920s in New York. Uh, the buildings no longer exist, but it surveys, they've got lovely plans and drawings, and they've got photographs. Very, very nice. But it's a very big, 290,000, it's, it's a very big number. You can't, I haven't looked at them all, I can't do. I've written bots to go through and look at them and do certain things. Um, but how do we then pick out the best and make those available to the public? And that's, that's the side of curation. It's not about restoration, but it's about how do you present the rep rep what's representative and what is the best? How do you take that subjective view and present something about it? Remember that Nelson Mandela image was actually quite low resolution, it's like 600 pixels. Still the most popular image. So if you were curating, you'd say, well, that's po popularity has to be part of it. And so we talk about educational value, public interest, the level of reuse, you know, where we can discover it's being used on Google Images and so forth. And then we've got some tools that we're building into these systems, uh, which if I'll show you the next slide, category intersections. So we, like Flickr tags, on commons, you can put things in categories, multiple categories. Here's a picture of a person holding a cat. You know, actually, this photograph was taken in 2005. It's a black and white photograph. All these can be different categories. Oh, you can put the species of the cat in there. You can put the person who actually happens to be African-American. You can put that in pictures of African-American people holding cats, suddenly. And, actually, and then we can look at the category intersections. This is a report um, that, I, that I regularly pull, uh, one of my tools regularly pulls for me. Uh, this just shows um, the most images that have been put at featured picture status out of my three quarters of a million images. These are the ones that might appear on the front of Wikimedia Commons or the front of Wikipedia. If an image is on the front of Wikipedia, on that day that it's featured on the front of Wikipedia, it normally gets 100,000 views by the public. So that's actually quite a lot of public exposure. Suddenly, it's suddenly got a big footprint on the internet for whatever it is. Um, uh, and this is quite great. You can see there's a Rights Museum image, there's a, an image from the Department of Defence of a wounded, wounded warrior taking a swim. Uh, but what a horrible list this is. It's just text, isn't it? It's boring. Is, is the next one there? Uh, no. Uh, what, I, what I do is I put that list in automatically into a gallery, and the tool does it for me. We don't have very easy tools to do that sort of thing. If I went to, say, the British Library, uh, three years ago, the British Library released their catalogue online. It contains quite a lot of images of all their artefacts. If I say to them, which are your most popular images in your from your catalogue, I can't tell you tell me the answer. They do Google Analytics, but they don't really look at these metrics around it and the measurements. And this is the other, this is this big challenge. We're down at curation, but behind curation is also <laughs> how do you test the quality of what we're releasing? How useful is it? We don't actually have good ways of measuring any of that. Um, this is something, a little test I set up. This is the weirdest photographs on Wikimedia Commons. Wikimedia Commons has 25 million uh, images. And um, this is just a subjective view by volunteers that decided to use this category. And then a bot sticks it into a rather sexy gallery. And uh, Joe and I had a little chat about virtual galleries. Yeah. How we rep one of the things when we were, uh, when I used to be a trustee of, of Wikimedia UK, we talked about <coughs> the, the virtual museum and the virtual gallery. And how, if you take something like this, if you want to walk through 25 million images and look at the best, if you've got good systems of curation, you can create the virtual gallery and walk through that. 
and it can reflect what you're interested in. I like that picture of a cat, or I like that 16th century manuscript, and it will start to structure a gallery around your interests, rather than just trying to show you <laughs> 25 million things which you can't engage with. And this is the same problem, exactly the same problem that the very wealthy Wellcome Trust have. They release their, their images online, but public engagement, how do you get that going? You get the researchers in, but they're wonderful images for the public to surf through. But then how do you solve this curation problem? They've got loads of money, I've got no money, neither of us have good solutions. Um, next one. Uh, and in terms of curation, there's an experiment I've got going on at the moment. Every now and then we try these experiments, this is one of mine. Um, I've, got to, uh, I've got to grips with um, the Flickr programming interface. That all of these things, to produce that report you saw earlier, there's a nice programmer's interface. You write something in a, in a programming language and pull a nice report. And Flickr, they're sort of open and closed at the same time, as I said. Their programmer's interface is open. You can use it, you can go onto their system, you can write all sorts of queries, you can write clever apps on your mobile phone. That's what they really want, they want, they want mobile apps. Uh, but what, I, what I've done is uh, I've automatically uploaded from Wikimedia Commons, I've pushed back to Flickr 70,000 images as an experiment. And within that are 30,000 images from the Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Art. Um, and I, from, although it's been on Commons for about two years, I've had maybe a handful of emails back about some of the images. In the first couple of weeks of having them on Flickr, I've had two important queries, one from somebody who was writing uh, a book about it and wanted to publish the image, is it really free? Another one was from uh, BBC Mumbai, saying we're, we're running a programme, we want to use this, is it really free? You know. And what's interesting is that the information here on Flickr points them to the museum and gives them all the data they want, but they're still writing back to me to check because they don't really believe it's free, you know, because you can't quite believe what you read on the internet. You know. uh, but the thing about measurement is that Flickr gives me an alternative slice because, of course, there's a whole volunteer community of viewers. I'm getting massive numbers of views on Flickr, and I can use that as a metric to do my curation and then do some... That's the experiment I'm doing. So at the moment, I've only got 70,000. I might make it that 100 and then I run that for about six months and see what I can do with measurements and twist that back to go back to something like Wikimedia Commons. Because on Commons, all I have is like Wikipedia uses, which is great, but it's not the level of public impact that you can see on Flickr. And what, one, of the, one of the other cha challenges then behind curation, is there another slide? There is another slide. Mm -hmm. um, this is my last slide, so you can look at the colours on this slide if you want. Uh, uh, I've put technical solutions, there are sort of <coughs> social solutions and other solutions, there's the volunteer community, the sort of thing we haven't talked about is one of the reasons that the Welcome were very excited about working with me was that as soon as I released my stuff I had 500 volunteers working on those images and they never had so many volunteers working on the images before. Where does it all and those are people from around the globe suddenly, not just here in London who might come to a meeting or something. Uh, and I've got some solutions, one's in green, I know there are solutions to some of these things. So, there is this project called Wikidata, and I've been working with, the reason that I did the Rights Museum uploads is that we've got, we're got having a painting project on Wikidata, and that means that there is a definitive authoritative record saying, here is this artist, mostly Dutch artists, uh, being the Rights Museum, uh, here is all the information about the artists when they were born, when they died, you know, other people that were working like them, and here are the key paintings, and the paintings are also on Wikidata, that's the paintings project. The books are much more controversial, but I can then, engineer that back into the images and you can talk about the curation. So you can have this artist's work and then you can say, actually these 10 different images we have are all of the same painting. At the moment, I don't have a solution for that. Even Google Images doesn't tell me this painting is actually the same as that painting. And actually then I can say, which of these images of the painting is better? But actually I know that the one from the Wright Museum is best, but the Wright Museum is really worried about how their collection is represented on the internet. For the most part, it's ghastly. Wrong colours, bad lighting, amateur images. So how do they get round that and get people to come to them? Now, if they made it free, how do they get somebody to put those versions on the front cover of their book? So we're sort of playing with solutions. Uh, we do categorise by what appears on a description of something. Um, I've, I'm experimenting with cross-channel sharing, which is this idea that not only do we release something here, but we also release it on Flickr or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you know, all at the same time, so we maximise our public impact. And then we measure it. And then the other thing that we don't have a solution for is which image is the same as that image. I've uploaded, a, so many times I've uploaded images 
um, like with Imperial War Museum, they refresh their collection and they change how they've encoded the image slightly. The Department of Defense does the same thing. I, I work with the Ministry of Defense and the Department of Defense in the US. And the Department of Defense keeps changing the EXIF data on an image every time they release it somewhere else. So you'll have, there's an authoritative definitive number called um, a virion for the Department of Defense. There isn't one for the Ministry of Defense. Ministry of Defense, wake up. And so the Department of Defense, you have this image, you, you can track it. So I know these images should be the same, but digitally I can't say that they are the same because they're digitally different. And I don't actually have a Google Images type matching to say this is 99.9% .9 confidence they are the same image, which is bizarre in the modern world. Why don't we have free stuff like that, that I can say this image is, it is the same as that one, it's just been twisted around a bit, or it's a crop, or it's been slightly recolored. Software exists to do it, but there aren't free services to do it, not on a large scale. And here are things, let's say, that's rare because Google Image Search works, but it's not freely available. We can't really re-engineer that into nice, natty tools. And Google keeps wanting to, they kind of, they sort of made it a little bit more, <coughs> and they close it down again, because it's really valuable. And they could make an awful lot of money out of that. And think of all the advertising revenue. So they're gonna make it completely free. Uh, and uh, the automatic image identification, is this a picture of a cat? It's slightly different, not just the digital identity, but is this a picture of a person? That's actually, that's a really important question. Because when it comes to copyright, if it's a person, there are personality rights. There are issues of pornography, which have been mentioned here before. So actually, if you're going to focus the human resource you have to review stuff, or which, which one should lawyers look at, Commons only has 25 million images. We can pretty much cope with it as volunteers. What happens when it's 250 million? What happens when it's one trillion? Actually, that suddenly becomes impossible. So to what extent are you responsible for it? That means that these things, which don't exist yet, but in theory they could be constructed. You can, at the moment you can run programs to say, I think this has a face in it, right? Okay, then I'm a person. You can run programs to say, I think this is a cat, you know? If you're really desperate to identify a long cat. So you can start to narrow it down. You can also say, is this image a subset of that image? And we've got some experiments to do exactly that with uh, map identification. There was an experiment with the British Library that did exactly that. But that would help you say, is it a copyright problem? Is this a person? Is anybody going to be worried about it? Or can we just stick it there in the bucket of free stuff and we don't really care? Like all the stuff that sits on Flickr. Any, anything pops up? That was my last slide, that's it. Yay. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much to all our speakers tonight. It's been really brilliant. But, um...